What's happening guys? Mike Moo here, back with another video of a Hisense TV. Now, this is a 70 inch TV. It's massive. And uh, the first thing I need you to know about this is that I got it because this is probably the best deal you're gonna have on a 70 inch TV before Black Friday. So this 70 inch TV is only $550. I got it from Best Buy. It is not sponsored. Uh, if there are any other deals coming up, I'll be sure to link some down below, but this is exactly where I got it from. Not sponsored. All right, so 70 inch TV, is it worth it? Well, first thing you need to know is that this is what we consider an entry level TV. This is the A6 series. I'll have the model number right on the screen right there. Um, but uh, the main key point about this is that it is 70 inches, 4K, Ultra HD for less than the price of my iPad, less than a third of the price of my iPhone Pro Max over here that's recording this site. And uh, it's just ridiculously cheap. Okay, so now with that in mind, obviously uh, look at all the features that it has. Okay, it's got, it's based on Android TV, which I still believe is the best operating system for any lower end TV set. Uh, features Hey Google, it is also Alexa enabled, which is, um, useful if you do want to tell it to go ahead and play certain things. Uh, some people use uh, Amazon's voice command system more than others. And it's Ultra 4K, Dolby Vision HDR plus HDR10. This is something that's usually only on a premium TV set. Uh, but I'm gonna warn you right now at this price point, there is no way that this is going to be able to match anything at a higher price range as far as HDR. It's gonna be quasi HDR. In fact, it probably might not even be that close. It's got an auto low latency game mode, which means that this is probably gonna be pretty decent for gaming as far as input lag is concerned. It's got Chromecast built in, which is something that is great if you do like to cast things to your TV screen, you wanna mirror something uh, that is really good as far as cross-platform compatibility. It's got an ultra slim design, and if you take a look at the picture right over here, you can see it's got ultra slim bezels. Now, the build quality is probably not going to be the best. I mean, it's $550. You got a whole 70 inch screen casing to have, so it's going to be as cheap as they come, but it's going to be sufficient. I mean, if you're not going to be moving around your TV a whole lot and you're not going to be mounting it and, and adjusting it a whole lot, it's just probably going to handle out pretty well. Now, it features Bluetooth. Okay, this is pretty common. A lot, of, I, a lot of questions that I usually get with regards to Bluetooth is, hey, can I connect my speakers to through Bluetooth? And the answer is, yes, you can. You can do that, or you can even do headphones, whatever you want. Works with Alexa, which I haven't tried out yet. It's got Dolby Vision, which just means that they paid some licensing to get some of their technologies in here. Unfortunately, with the Dolby Vision though, and the DTS Virtual X around, this does not support eARC, all right? It supports only ARC return, so it's gonna have compressed audio output. So don't expect this to be able to process a lot of audio out uh, in a really uncompressed, highest quality format. And generally you're not going to, and in this price range, most people don't have a really fancy home theater setup that they're gonna connect with this anyways. Motion rate 120 hertz. I believe this is going to be quasi. It's going to be 60 hertz native and quasi 120 hertz, maybe through interpol interpolation. So it's not going to be as awesome as something that's true motion rate 120 hertz. All right. Now, uh, this screen in particular, come this one in particular is a VA panel, which means it's going to have better contrast ratios, but uh, there's going to be some uh, wide angle viewing issues compared to uh, popular IPS channel TVs of which a high sense 65 inches. All right. Um, there are different, I mean, even though it's the same series, which is the A6 series, there's going to be ones that are going to be IPS, uh, IPS panels versus VA panels, but this is going to be better. You get a VA panel, uh, because it will have higher contrast ratios, which means it's going to be better in uh, darker environments. So it's going to have better contrast between the, the lights and the darks. Unfortunately, because it is a low-end TV, it's not gonna be as dynamic and the contrast ratio is not gonna be as nice as late, maybe like a mini LED or one of the fancier models, okay? So this would work great as an everyday TV. It'll be great for casual gaming. Just keep it kind of dark, all right? Over here, uh, it is already, it's 3.30. I got a cloudy day. This is about as light as I'm gonna have it in this room. 
uh, when I'm watching TV. So it's going to be okay, right? It's an everyday TV. This is not something that you're going to want uh, for like reference or really ultra high resolution uh, videos and be able to display the awesome HDR capabilities uh, even of your iPhone, um, you know, latest iPhone videos, for instance. It's not going to go handle that. If you have the, one of the latest next generations or current latest top end Xbox series, you're not going to be able to take advantage of a lot of those features that the Xbox has or the PlayStation 5. You're going to want to get a more expensive TV set than that. But if you're watching general TV, right, uh, general just Average uh, TV shows, Netflix, you know, Amazon Prime, any of these things that are supported, which is basically everything, this is going to be okay as an everyday TV. I wouldn't call it perfect for the main TV set, but as an everyday TV set, it's going to be okay. And this is just with my experience with these lower end TVs. All right, but we'll get down to the real meat of it later in an upcoming video. Right now, I'm just going to unbox it. And then you can go ahead and see um, how things are inside and really w how cheaply they can construct something for $550 and still try to make a profit. All right, now, I own, let's see, I've purchased at least two, two other Hisense TVs, one of which is a somewhat of a more popular um, video of a 300 I believe a $300 865 series TV set. And that was, I think it was in 2020, or is it 2019? Anyway, I don't expect too much has changed. I don't expect too much has changed because uh, as far as the construction and as far as the panel quality. So I've been pretty happy with that as a secondary TV and it's worked out pretty well in the bedroom. In fact, I actually think that it's a little bit too bright for us uh, for use in a bedroom. And I imagine that's gonna max out at about 200 nits of brightness. And just to give you an example, I think the latest iPhone, if you wanna be able to view a screen outside, is over a thousand nits. So you're looking at something that is relatively dim and it's not something that you're gonna to wanna to use. I mean, it's cheap, right? You're not gonna to wanna to use this outdoors. Okay, so two feet actually looks almost identical to Another TV that I've looked at, so looks like the same summer construction. It's all plastic actually, um, but it'll probably do the job. Obviously it will. So it looks like there's two screws on the bottom, two screws on the bottom that you go ahead and screw on on both sides, four screws total. I'm gonna set these aside a little bit. And since this is a 70 inch TV, this is probably not going to fit inside of most small sedans or cars, comp like subcompact class cars. And I do have a compact SUV, and that this is not going to fit in that. At least not inside, or not in the box anyway. All right, so uh, it's pretty well packaged, I see. Question is, can I get this out myself? <laughs> the answer is probably only if I do it very carefully. Okay. <sighs> when unpacking the TV, do not press or hit the TV screen as you can remove it, mount it in the wall. Yeah, 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 you gotta, because you could break it. Yeah. Before I dispose of packaging, make sure all parts and accessories are removed. As you know, there's user guide and remote control. Okay. Well, Pretty standard stuff. Question is, how do I get it out by myself? Okay. Okay. Two side pieces over here. And that keeps it stable in place. This might be something that I'm gonna need some extra help from someone. But my wife is in the meeting right now. This front piece of the space come out separately? The answer is no. Okay. So, if you're looking at this, it tells you where the front is, uh, which means that it's safer if I plop it down flat to let it out on the back side, not the front side. So. 
things by myself. I'm going to do it this way. This all the way out here. And then, more or less, more gently, just lay it down. Oh, like that. two little holes here. I'm gonna... Oh, I see what they did. <clears throat> okay, so there are the two mounting holes on this side, and then there must be two on the other side. All right. So I removed two of them there. Must be two more of the same exact thing on this side, yeah. All right, so those are two. Those are currently locking pieces. You remove this and hopefully the front completely comes out. Let's see how yeah, this works. Alright, so these two, two front four locking pieces. Yeah, like I have, and then the whole uh, I get it, I get it. They did. <laughs> There's actually an illustration about how you want to do it. And it's right on the box. If you look at it, it's in yellow. Unfortunately, this box is so huge that I can't display it right now without it. I'll do an overlay on it. All right, you know what? I'm just going to put this back here against the projector screen. And then this is the front side. Okay, I'll slide this back a little bit. Now they really want to warn you not to press into the screen because there is hardly any bezel. And let's see, yep, there's hardly any bezel. So you gotta be very careful. This piece comes out. Completely recyclable. It's great. And I guess it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Oh, see, this whole thing, this whole thing is bezel. There's like no real grabbing point, and they really want to warn you about that so that you don't mess up your TV set. All right. <laughs> Still, you do that. And you kind of like wonder, all right, can I, can I actually, can I actually lift this up? <sighs> all right, so, do that. You're supposed to get some help. Put it on the back, all right. You know what, I'm going to start with my plan. We're laying it back down. Now we'll put, uh, I'll put this, Nice piece in the back. Just lay it down on that. That's what. touching the front of the screen. Remove the bottom piece here. And just slide this away. Looks like what we got here, of course, is the package that they told you, they warned you about. So they don't really give you much of any accessories on a cheap TV. 
you can imagine. At least it's good that they have this remote control, which looks very similar to the other remote control that I've had from Hisense. Except the difference is I see that they have Netflix, YouTube, Prime Video, Disney Plus, Peacock Plus, and Tubi. So Tubi and Peacock and Disney Plus are kind of relatively new. This uses double, triple, no, triple A batteries, which they include some cheap ones, which is great. And then you got the power cord, which is standard figure eight. And then you got four screws to mount to the back, uh, to the bottom of those legs that I have over here. All right. So now I'm gonna carefully remove this protective foam slash plastic. Maybe I need to title this video how to set up the 70 inch TV by yourself. Not everybody reads the instructions, even though the instructions are on the box. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is go ahead and get the feet in here. Now, down here, I see there are two separate areas to go ahead if you have to go to set up your, your TV screen. And um, if you put them more on the inside, it's, it's okay for smaller tables, right? And if you do it from outside, it's okay for uh, the bigger tables. Just make sure that if you do, this one's R2, that's R1, and then that's L2 and then L1. Make sure you match those up, okay? So I'll give you some dimensions in between those. And the inside ones, you just basically need a 31, it's 31 inches, 30, 31 inches between the two inside ones. And if you have a nice big wide space, it's better to do the outside ones. It's going to be a little bit more stable. And that will be 51, 52 inches. Okay, in between. That's what we're looking at. 50, 51, 52. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and install the bottom legs so that this can stand on its own. These little guys right here. I'm gonna do it on the outside for now. And yes, in case you're wondering, you can mount it. You can definitely mount these uh, on, on the wall. Just keep in mind the weight requirements. So that's the, the R1 over here. Keep in mind that there are weight requirements that you're gonna need to look at and make sure that it can handle it. I'm gonna use one of these foam things to prop it up a little bit. Okay, there we go. All right, propped up. Down here, in case you're wondering, is either LED screen slash uh, remote sensor, most likely. Okay, so all you need is a regular screwdriver for this. Let's see if I have my little powered one with a head available. Yeah. All you need is a Phillips head. Very straightforward. Now you might wonder how can you tell which one's left and which one's right? It'll look like that probably. Because if I stick the wrong one in, let's see if I stick the wrong one in. Actually. Looks like they both work. How is it designed? Okay, so it's probably designed such that the front does not stick out as much. This is where you look at the user guide, just to double check because this will still fit either way. All right, 70 inch. 
So the screws, in case you're wondering, is the M5 X12. And the longer part is the part that goes towards the front. I suppose that does make sense. So, if that's the case, then it can only fit one way. Oh, if you look really closely, it actually tells you left and right, right? Now, the left is not your left when you're facing the TV. The left is, that's the problem with this, is that whose left are you talking about? Well, just match the left and the right with the R and the R, and you'll be okay. See, R down here, and the R. Just match it up that way. These don't need to be in too tight. Don't over tighten them. That was not tight enough. Just to get it in there though. So hand tighten them if you're gonna use a or know what your know what your torque settings are. I set mine to uh, 15. Yep, 15 looks okay. Feels okay. So make sure you match them. Match them up correctly. Okay, I guess that's pretty much it. All right. Carefully lift this up. Man, 70 inches is huge. These things back in 2013 were first introduced. 70 inches was the largest size TV that you could not buy because they were special order only and basically experimental. Uh, basically, the TV manufacturers at the time take him to a show called CES. It used to be called the Consumer Electronics Show. And what they would do is showcase how large they can make their TVs. So back in 2013, roughly 70 inches, which is, was as large as you can get. And it was like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 was probably the asking price at the time. You can imagine there were only a handful of people that actually purchased them back at the time. Fast forward eight years now, I'm standing here in my living room with a 70 inch TV that cost $550 with probably better picture quality than all the other stuff. All right, now we're gonna take a look at the, the input ports here. So I see that the power is all the way on the left side. Okay, keep that in mind. But you know what? These, these, um, you know, it's really hard to move this TV set. The, uh, okay, here we go. Oh, ho, ho, ho. okay. So, um, the power's on the left hand side, all the way on that opposite side. And you know what? I really don't understand why they don't keep them on one side because I think that they should, but that's not the case here. Okay, so let's look at this. Over here, and go ahead and read out exactly what I have going on. Okay, huh, looks like you still have funnel input. No super VHS though. So you still have the funnel plugs. You got a headphone, you got a little service jack, maybe separate diagnosis. You got a LAN port which is good, just connect them to your uh, ethernet network. And even though this is a smart TV, uh, if you're gonna use most of the features of it, of course it has built-in Wi-Fi, but if you're gonna use most of the features of it, you're gonna wanna connect to the internet. And if you don't, then you know you use it like a regular display, and that's probably fine, because you could just use one of the HDMI ports. This particular model only has three HDMI ports, of which only HDMI 1 at 4K 60 Hertz is ARC, audio return channel, okay? So you're gonna wanna plug in 
your main source in the HDMI one, whatever it is that you're gonna do. For me, it's gonna be the Apple TV primarily until I get a receiver, or if I get a receiver, then I'll plug it in there. Okay, so that, that's, that's the case. It actually has an antenna cable, so it actually has a tuner, which uh, is a nice surprise because they don't necessarily have those in a lot of TVs now, and it's something that I may or may not use. I don't know. All right. And then we got HDMI 2 and HDMI 3. They're all uh, 4K 60 hertz, but only one of them is ARC and not eARC. Okay, not the better eARC. It's got digital audio output down here, which is good directly for the sound bar, because trust me, uh, a TV with bezels this thin probably isn't going to have the best sound in the world. So a sound bar is going to be nice, but I have Bluetooth speakers, so I might do that instead. Uh, it's got a USB 1 and a USB 2. Now, these are 5 volts, 0.5 amps maximum for both of these. So you cannot, you probably cannot use these to power your, your Chromecast or your, uh, you know, other dongle type devices like Amazon Fire TV. Uh, that's not going to provide enough power to let it run stably, all right? So it might run limp mode, may or may not, and uh, that's something that you're just going to have to be aware of. Now, I see the mounting points in the back here for mounting the TV up on the wall if you so want to. Now, since this is a 70 inch TV, these mounting holes are hugely widely spaced out. And I do believe, I don't have my notes in here, but let me take a look at the notes here. I do believe that it looks like you need a, okay. They are, 400 by 300 millimeters, that's a wall hole pattern. And the wall mount screw size is M6, all right? So, yeah, that's that's huge, 400, 400 millimeters by 300 millimeters, that's just gonna take a lot uh, to, um, you're just gonna need one of those big mounts, all right, to go ahead and mount it, make sure it supports uh, 70 inches. Okay, that's pretty much it. Now, the build quality is exactly as I imagine. Well, actually, you know what? This is a little bit better. I like this indentation uh, out here. This little body area seems to protect the area pretty well. This whole part seems fairly thick, and I imagine that it's going to be the case of a cheaper TV, right? It's not going to be super slim. Bottom, I feel some grills, probably where some uh, heat comes out as well, and there's some ventilation up top, so make sure you don't cover any of those things. AC input on the other side, that's about it. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's that's all I can see from this TV. Now moving it's going to be a little bit more difficult because of how large it is. <laughs> you should have two people. You should have two people move it if, if if at all possible. But because I only have the one, and that's me, I'm going to go ahead and take this. And what I'm going to do is put some plastic underneath the feet on. I guess I should do it on this side first so that there's less friction because there is you could use uh, you could use what do you call those things furniture sliders if you're gonna be sliding it around like this not advised two people it's probably the best way to do it but for the purposes of this video, and I'm not gonna. <laughs> All right, one side at a time. One side at a time. God, this is huge. Oh. Does anyone need a TV this large? If you don't need a TV this large, they all have. Uh, they have a 60-inch model which is gonna be identical to this review. Now, if you get a 65 inch model of this one, same series, you need to know that it is a different display, okay, entirely. It's gonna have a wider viewing angle because it's IPS and claim switching versus a VA panel, which is what this one is. The reason why I'm doing this is because there's actually rubber feet down below that add some friction to it, which is good, because you don't want this to slide off of your uh, 
your TV mount and onto the floor. <laughs> yeah, you definitely don't want that. All right, okay. Move this over to the back. And yeah, we'll leave it like that. What is interesting to me is that I'm looking for, you know how they used to, on the, on the TV sets, used to tell you, oh, here we go. How much energy usage? It's right here. So they're looking at, and this is funny, the energy guide here, let's see if we can get a close-up shot here. The energy guide says that it will take roughly estimated yearly annual cost $38 and that is at a rate of 12 cents per kilowatt hour based on five hours of use a day. So estimated yearly use of this model is 316 kilowatt hours. Now my kilowatt hours here in the San Francisco Bay Area is quite a bit more than that. And if I watch it five hours at a time, we're looking at roughly 80 some dollars. But 80 some dollars a year, that's not too bad. So these are, these are fairly energy efficient. These are to protect, these things here are to protect you when you're handling it, or actually protect the screen, protect you, you know, from damaging it. So if you're gonna move it again, you can keep these around. These are just basically foam covered cardboard. All right, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, first power on. I've got the power cable. All you gotta do is plug that sucker in. Yeah, the uniformity of the screen is not too bad. Doesn't look like there's any damage from the move. That's usually a good thing to check. That's one of the first things you wanna check. Because if you do end up returning this TV set, what will happen is they will have to do the exact same thing. They need to double check to make sure that the screen wasn't cracked while it was in your possession or during transport. Because if it was, you don't have accidental coverage protection, you're gonna have very tough conversation with the nice people at, at uh, Best Buy or wherever you bought your TV from. Okay, first power on. We are looking good. First power on right over there. I'm gonna have to adjust camera here. Now I'm in a relatively bright room. English, okay. United States. Now I'm in a relatively bright room. Pacific. English, United States. Quickly set up your TV with your Android Pacific. phone. You know what? I think Quickly I'll do this. Quickly set up your TV with Grab your, your Android, Android phone. Okay. You know what? Let's see how well that works. Grab your hand. Now if you want to see the complete setup without using the Android phone, just watch my other video. I go through the entire setup. Looks like the setup looks identical to the one before. So on your Android phone, open the pre-installed app Google, which I'm gonna do now, right now. So the setup is gonna be identical to what um, what I did on the other Android TV device. But here, in case, instead of saying the whole OKG OK set up my device, I uh, actually just typed it in on my phone. So here I am connecting. It says to verify a code that gets displayed. And I am just clicking on that next. I, I pick the Wi-Fi and copy my Google account settings to the, to the actual uh, TV, which is pretty cool. Choose the account I'm gonna use. It's now copying my account details directly from, I guess this is one benefit of using an Android device versus uh, your, um, Every day, most people use iPhone. Uh, 
It's now copying, copying the account information. Hopefully this shouldn't take more than uh, 10 minutes or so. But I'm looking at the screen right now and during the daytime, this is okay. During the daytime with the blinds closed in the living room, this is totally okay. I don't have any problems with, uh, with the level of the brightness. The thing that is really going to bug certain people is if you really have or watch a lot of HDR content. You watch a lot of HDR content or you have, you know, you bought the latest, greatest gaming machine. You're probably going to want a better TV in that case. You choose a name. Um, I'll just call it a... Uh, High sense 70. Hopefully this works. And you can change this later. The main key part about naming whatever it is is so that uh, when you are searching for your TV in your network or you are asking you know, Amazon's device or asking the big G to go ahead and uh, do certain things, like I can say, hey, yada, yada, play something, something on Hisense 70. That's what it's going to do. Okay, so this is uh, supposedly the latest version of Android TV. Okay, so I think it's version 10. That's one of the benefits of getting a newer TV is that you're going to get the newest upgrade for a little bit longer. Now, what remains to be seen is how well this handles after you get, you know, you install a lot of apps. And generally, I'm going to tell you, install only what you plan on using. Don't install too much because that could really affect your usage of the TV. Okay, so. There's, certain, there's going to be certain apps that are just going to be too taxing for the system. It's going to slow down your interface and, you're, and you keep it running and you're going to wonder, hey, why is my TV slowing down to a crawl? Like, like it's running an old operating system. And you don't want that, right? No one wants that. Okay, so you have to accept the terms and conditions, right? And that's something new. I mean, that, that's something that, that is new as of, you know, smart TVs. Now, you can choose whether or not you want to help improve Hisense products and services. I generally say no, because that it, it, basically you're, you're telling you to go ahead and give them uh, access to your, uh, the way you use a TV. And I, I don't want that, right? Um, all right, I'll register my TV. And here is it is done. So notice when it's done, it gives you a couple of modes. You can do, you could do uh, home mode, you can do store mode for demo, or you could do store mode with video. Obviously, I'm just gonna do home mode straight up. There we go. Got already all this stuff that was installed on my last Android TV setup, probably, and the more popular uh, TV shows are already set up, ready to go. And I do believe I still need to log in. It would be really awesome if it already got all my info, and no, it does not have all my info. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to put all that in there anyway. Now I just heard a little blip of the sound. It sounds pretty decent, like it sounds okay, but you know, you, it's definitely not gonna be as good as uh, as good as a sound bar. So you should, you should always get a sound bar. All right, so enhanced viewing. This is something that happens and it asks you, this asked me last time I set up Hisense TV and it's asked me whether or not I wanna do enhanced viewing, which is enabled by automatic content recognition. And uh, it, basically the idea is that um, they will get information about what you're watching, okay? And then combine that with the information about you anonymously to go ahead and help them deliver more features to this TV set. I think it really only helps uh, helps Hisense in particular, of course, because then it just it just uh, shares information about what you want to 
watch a service. So um, I think one time I did it, I consented to it. I, I'm not going to consent to it this time. And it's not going to affect whether or not you can use certain features on a TV set. I think it's just in general for them to collect information, data about what you're watching to help them understand how to better uh, produce content. So for instance, uh, if this reports back to uh, you know all the, all the providers that, that hey, this is an HDR capable TV and here's the internet speed, then then we go like, okay, it looks like a lot of our audience can now support HDR, can support uh, 4K Ultra HD and they have a, enough speed in order to do this. So maybe we should start producing or looking at producing more content that, um, that users can go ahead and enjoy from home because the TV is capable of it. Okay, so uh, he, this is, this is pretty cool. I mean, okay, so on a remote control right over here, it didn't actually ask me if I needed to set up the Google. So I'm going to click on that and see if anything happens. Press the menu button to pair the Bluetooth remote first. Yeah, okay, so I still do have to, uh, to go ahead and, and pair the Bluetooth remote control, which I'm going to do by holding down the menu button here. Let's see if that works. Let's use it pairing. Okay, pair failed. <laughs> that obviously did nothing. Bluetooth remote connecting. Okay, paired successfully. All right, so I said on a screen, uh, this is the remote button down here, this this bottom right piece over here. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see because it's, it's suddenly gotten dark here. But the one that's on top of the channel up is the, uh, the mini button. So now it's paired. So now if I talk to Google, I can actually have it look for things. So I have a hold down the Google button, talk in a remote control, and there is a microphone up here at the very top by the power button, open YouTube. Let's see if that works. Try saying, okay, looks like open YouTube. There it is. So now it just pops up some related videos supposedly. And if I install the other stuff, it's, uh, it's also gonna work as well. So apparently I don't hold down the button, I just press the button and I have access to Google Home. And I'm gonna go over some of the features on here. This looks very similar, it feels pretty quick. Um, this top right hand side inputs, this is probably something that a lot of us are gonna use, particularly since I like using Apple TV, so I'm gonna use Apple TV after I plug it in. Uh, this is to check your connection to the Wi-Fi or change it, and now we go to the settings. All right, settings. You should set up your device name, yada, yada. Okay, let's look at some picture settings. Okay, backlight. First one, dynamic backlight control. You should probably just leave that alone, but you can manually adjust it if you want to. And it looks like, uh, let's, see, let's see where we're at right now. We are at backlight. Wait, no, I'm gonna turn off dynamic and I'm gonna manually adjust it. So it's at 75. Let's see how bright this can get. I gotta say the VA, the VA panel looks like it has pretty decent contrast, so I like that. Now, dynamic backlight control might work out just fine. I'll leave it alone. And basically what that does is that uh, it will sense, roughly, there should be an optical sensor somewhere. It's probably down below by the Hisense logo where it, it sort of senses how much ambient light is around. And based on that, it'll adjust the backlight, uh, the overall brightness, basically, of the LEDs in the back. Uh, to go ahead and adjust the picture mode. Now, the different picture modes, there's vivid, standard, energy saving, sports, theater, day, and theater at night. Now, if you wanna keep at the $80 price point per year, if you watch five hours a day, you're gonna leave on an energy saving because that's what the setting is for up there. Now, if you leave it on standard, it's gonna be a little bit brighter, it's gonna use up a little bit more power. Uh, basically, you're gonna use up more electricity, just FYI, so you know. So out of the box, the contrast, brightness uh, are at 50, colors at 55, tint is zero, sharpness is at 10. Picture size is wide, HDMI 2.0 format is standard format. Note that this does not support the latest HDMI 2. Point, you know, whatever, 2.1, 2. Point such and such. And as such, because it does not support that, you're not gonna get all the nice cool functions and features of, uh, of the stuff from like the, the latest Gen Xbox or PlayStation 5. All right, let's jump over to advanced settings. I can do overscan, uh, color temperature, interesting. That really is weird because 
Um, okay, so if you do color temperature low, it's going to be more yellowish. So really, you're looking at 3000 hertz versus 6500 probably at the highest point. And this is just personal preference. Generally, if you're worried about blue light, then keep it away from high, keep it on low. So for instance, if you only watch this TV, you know, in the evenings, and generally you want a warm color temperature, then you keep color temperature at low. All right, I guess medium is just a happy in between. Noise reduction, uh, looks like the default is medium. I'll just go ahead and leave that alone. And if you want the most sharpness, then you turn that off. But of course, if you do that, then you might end up seeing noise, basically pixels. Pixelation on the screen, depending on the resolution of whatever it is that you're looking at, right? If something that's noisy, uh, it could bother you a lot, then you come back in here and change the noise reduction and change it to something, you know, like high. I'll, I'll turn it off. To, I'll turn it off. Digital noise reduction, also similar type of thing too, except this is digital. Uh, I don't know exactly what the difference is between the two of them, but I'm turning both of them off. Now, you're watching, let, let's say you're streaming, you're streaming at like a sports thing and the highest bit rate that you can, and the blockiness is really bugging you, come back in here and adjust these settings, okay? That's pretty much what we're looking at. HDMI automatic dynamic range is set on auto, basically because I have nothing plugged in right now, okay? If I have something plugged in, I can try to force something else to, to uh, take advantage of HDR a little bit better, but I'm gonna tell you, you're probably gonna be disappointed in the lower end TV like this. Uh, active contrast, interesting. So it'll automatically adjust the contrast. All right, I'll leave that alone. Color space, native. I'll try auto. What the heck is that? I don't know what the, what the difference is between all these things. Um, so, so these are some of the new functions and features in here. And if, if you do native, I'll just do auto. I'll, I'll do some color testing to see exactly how accurate the color is and what the color range of the hair. Um, okay, so those are advanced uh, settings. This is calibration settings. Um, apparently I can adjust the colors separately to get the best out of this. And I will do some testing on here to see exactly what kind of settings we can get to get the best possible out of everything. Okay, so looks like there's two point, there's 20 point. Obviously 20 points can be better. Gamma 2.2 is pretty standard, but look, you got some other choices in here. Leave all this stuff alone, okay? Uh, you, you, you can mess around with it later. Generally, out of the box, it looks okay. RGB only, okay? Those are, those are different calibration settings. And what's cool, this is new, okay? Wasn't an older Hisense TV, is that the picture settings that is set on here I can apply to all sources or, for instance, uh, this screen with, this, with what it's capable of right now is probably pretty decent for a computer monitor, all right? So if you are calibrating it to computer monitor as a computer monitor, and I'm going to do that later, uh, I'm gonna try to get the best picture possible and see what the wide gamut range and how much colors this can display appropriately and accurately. This is more important, obviously, if you are a purist or someone who's a photographer, videographer like I am, and you want to worry a little bit more about the color, if you use particularly the, if you connect this to a computer, which I probably will, okay. Then you can go ahead and set up individual settings for the different sources. So if I choose current source, then that's going to be HDMI 1, 2, or 3, okay. And that's pretty cool. So you can, you can adjust different picture settings for the different sources that you have. All right. Then of course you can reset everything. Now, you see how these things are grayed out? That's because I don't have any of those plugged in right now. Now, if I have an HDMI source plugged in, then you will see that there are gonna be different choices for that. Now, now that was picture. Now looking at sound, system sounds. If you don't like all the sounds this is making as I'm switching, you can change it. Sound mode, you got theater, sports, music, speech, and late night. And I do believe this basically adjusts, it's just like an equalizer and slash compressor. Obviously, if you only watch the TV at night and you don't want to bother the neighbors, switch it to late night, that's going to compress the signals a little bit. And, uh, you know, if you do speech, then it's going to probably do the equalizer where it boosts the mid-range, etc. Okay, so let me, let me just leave that alone. Audio output TV speakers, or you can do ARC, which is the HDMI output of the one audio return channel of HDMI one, or you can do Bluetooth. So those are some options you can choose from here, just like what I was saying. 
And uh, it looks like because you're choosing between them, you can't have both of them on at the same time. I don't know why you would, maybe you would. Maybe it would be kind of cool if the speakers is actually decent and just use the speaker inside for the center channel. But no, that's not an option. All right, you can turn on the TV speakers on or off independently, uh, which is cool in case any of these settings don't work out. True base HD. Okay, so you should just leave these things on. Um, dialogue clarity, I suppose, because they know the potential crappy quality of the built-in speakers. Okay, so uh, if you plug in your own speakers or you do your own speakers, you do HDMI audio arc, you'll want to play these settings to see what best works out for you. Uh, True volume HD. Not sure exactly what that is, but when I find out, I'll put it on a screen. Uh, wall mount setup. Okay. <laughs> this, if you set it on a wall, I think it'll configure the speakers to fire out a certain different direction, different way. I think that's what that's about. Okay, advanced settings. You can do the balance, auto volume control, digital audio output type, PCM, you know, or pass through, uh, just do auto. I don't believe that the eARC, oh, okay. So the eARC cannot pass out Dolby, Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, or any of those other fancy things. But the fiber optic output of the digital audio output can. So there you go, you can adjust that. Uh, digital audio delay is pretty important, particularly for Bluetooth. If you connect this via Bluetooth speakers, there's gonna be a little bit delayed. This allows you to adjust some of those settings. That's what this is here for. Same thing with the lip sync. Um, Interesting how there's two of the different settings. Now, I guess if I have to adjust these, I will let you know. But since I'm using APTX, I don't think I'm gonna have this problem. We'll see, all right. Uh, then they have a whole separate equalizer. So these are the different, uh, different settings that you can do at the different frequencies, starting at uh, uh, 120 hertz, all the way up to 10 kilohertz. 120 hertz being the lower end, all the way up to 10 kilohertz being the higher end. Preferred audio language, you can choose only between English, Spanish, and French. There's also a headphone only mode and a headphone volume mode. And I do believe this is only for the headphone output port in the back. I do believe that's the case. All right. So that's what's in the sound. Uh, inputs, okay. So you got, so basically there's four inputs with three HDMI inputs. Uh, HDI control, you want that on, device auto power off, leave everything on here. This is gonna be consumer electronics control, which basically allows you to choose, like let's say if you wanna turn off all your devices at once and you use a separate third party device, let's say the Apple TV, um, it'll allow you to, or allow the Apple TV to control the, the TV through HDMI, which is exactly what you want. So leave this alone. Um, let, let me look at the composite input since there isn't a whole lot. So with this input, if you even use it, or if you don't use it, you, you can just turn it off so you don't confuse anybody. But you can also name it separately something else, so that's pretty cool. Uh, for instance, custom name, I could just say VCR, for instance. And this way, when someone's switching between the inputs, they'll know exactly what's what. Now that, that's pretty neat. So I can rename all these things, all right? I could rename this to Apple TV, for instance. I could just stick in there, put in, capital, uh, put in a, a whole type in a whole different thing and just call that the Apple TV. All right, so that's what's going on with the inputs. Parental control, this is probably gonna be very important for, for parents or anybody that does not wanna, you know, that wants to block certain programs or content for anything that, that supports it. So you can set up a password so that you can go ahead and, and uh, control um, when you can block usage of either channels, program blocking, or input blocking, or others, all right? Now, if you do input blocking, I suppose, if you have the TV fully secured and you have the Xbox, let's say, connected to HDMI version, uh, HDMI one, you can block the whole HDMI one completely doing, during a different schedule. So for instance, no playing Xbox from Monday through Friday, you know, you, you can go ahead and do all that in the parental control. I'm not a parent yet, I'm not gonna adjust any of that, but it's really cool that this is here. This is not available in a lot of TV operating systems and I, I think this is really great. Okay, so if you have five nephews over, I can go ahead and control it and make sure that they're not watching TV past a certain um, you know, time, for instance. Just have it completely blocked off and remove all adult stuff so there's no way that they can uh, freak themselves out because they're little kids. Okay, 
So that's parental control. I'm not going to go too far in it. Network and internet, pretty self-explanatory. You select your Wi-Fi from here. And, you know, the, the, these are all the different Wi-Fi set up. Uh, you can wake on, okay, leave everything here alone. There's not a lot that you need to do on here. Okay, content sharing, ah, interesting. So, um, ooh, wake on cast. I guess that's pretty neat. Wake on wireless network, wake on LAN, wake on cast. Okay, so the wake on cast, how that works is the TV, when it's in sleep mode, it's not really ever off. But wake on cast is if I'm casting something to the TV set, so for instance, it'll turn on. So for instance, if I went ahead and asked Amazon, you know what, to say, hey, show the front door on Hisense 70, it will turn on the TV set and show me what's going on on the front door ring camera. That's pretty cool, All right? I'm not gonna do that right now, but that's what Wake On Cast is in case, you know, the TV's off and I wanna be able to do that, okay. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Uh, that's accounts and sign in. I wonder if, yeah, you can, add a, you can add other accounts on here too. So if you have multiple family members with different profiles on there and you wanna switch between them and all the apps they have, uh, I think you can do that. But I'm just keeping it on the main one. All right, these are the apps that were recently opened or installed. You got permissions, app permissions, and special app access. So if you want to control what the apps can do or not do on your TV, so for instance, you're worried about a certain shady app, for instance, or some sort of app that you just don't want to have access to your information, you can go ahead and, go ahead and do that and go ahead and check in here. I think this is great, actually. So those are, those are pretty neat, things that I did not see before. Okay, so app permissions, you can see what's allowed, who has access to what um, storage, for instance, let's see, yep. Google Play Services has access to storage, which makes sense. Now those apps, I think they're pre-installed already. I didn't do anything about any of that. Okay, so these things were already pre-installed in here or linked to my Google account from my last time that I set up a Google uh, TV. All right, so let me go down to device preferences and look at this. So date and time, you set a timer, language, uh, Amazon Alexa service, which basically I can connect to my uh, Amazon account. And I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm not gonna do that in this video. I think it's pretty straightforward. Let's see how much storage. Oh, unfortunately, device storage is only 4.3 gigabytes, gigabytes. So you're not gonna be installing anything massive on here. But good news is you got two USB ports in the back and you can side load stuff through those USB ports. So, so if you really wanted to hack the system in some sort of way, you can. All right, I, I don't know if I'd recommend it. I think it's better if you just get an HDMI, uh, a separate device and, and do that instead rather than do it through the TV because really you don't want a whole lot of things running on TV, just the basic stuff. All right, home screen. What shows on a home screen? Video previews, audio previews. I can reorder the apps. Let's say I don't want Netflix to be the first thing to, to pop up. I can also reorder the game separately because you can install games. And I can customize the channels that actually get shown. And for instance, if I watch Facebook Watch, then I'll turn that on. If I bought a lot of movies uh, from Google Play, I could do that. And these are all the ones that are on now. Promotional channels, App Spotlight, okay. Obviously, there are gonna be more channels as uh, I install more things. These are the things that were already installed. Okay, so there's never any chance that someone will not be able to find something that they might wanna watch. Uh, games, let's see what games were already installed. Actually, I don't have any games installed. So I can, I, they make it really easy. Click on Get More Games to show you what kind of games you could go install. And as I'm looking at the screen right now, okay, right now, I am seeing local brightness all the way around as a frame on the picture. I'm gonna try this out like late in the dark and see how well it works. But I'm looking at this right now and I don't know if that's just something that Google does or if that is natively the TV. Like I will do some TV testing to let you know what's going on, all right. Find TV games. All right, let's see what TV games we have. Let's just take a quick look in here. I don't know why it's loading so slowly, but I will tell you that I have had some Wi-Fi issues very recently. 
and that might be the case, it might not be the TV's fault. Okay, so it looks like it's still taking a while. And I don't know why. All right, now, um, oh, this is why, because I need to install the latest version of Google Play Games. So there still needs to be some updates that need to happen in order for you to take advantage of all these functions, features, and settings. And that's usually a pretty good idea. What is interesting about this setup is that as part of the setup process, because I use my Google phone, it actually didn't ask me to check for updates for the TV, which is unusual because when you get something new that's a smart device, you often have to, you often have to uh, check for updates, all right? Because this is basically a computer now, a computer with a giant screen. And looks like it recommends that I can play Magic Rampage, Aliens versus, you can play Pinball, Meltdown, Walking Dead Season 1. This is, this is what I already had installed in the past, I guess. So what I will try is Aliens versus Pinball. I'll go ahead and install that. Let's see what it's like. Okay. So I think it's installing the background. All right, let me get out of this. Let's install that and let, let's, let's get, okay, install. Looks like I can't actually multitask and do something else as it's installing, but uh, generally you got a brand new TV that was in 2021. It's gonna have a faster processor than the older stuff. So right now everything seems pretty speedy. Uh, obviously it's right out of the box. You don't really have a whole lot installed, but you know, you install a lot of things, you let your kid or whoever install a lot of other different apps, then you could start to see some issues that uh, that you might not have ex might not experience. Now the good news is is that since this is the newest one, it's got Android 10. It's probably going to be supported for several more years uh, with the latest stuff. But keep in mind, potentially, let's say, let's say 10, uh, let's say 10, 20 years from now. Hypothetically, 10, 20 years from now, would you would you still have this TV? And if you did, Android probably not be, not be supported. Who knows if Google is going to be around? Okay. So looks like I will need to go ahead and allow it to have all this stuff in order to continue. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And everything is locked. So I don't even know what the point is of showing this because. I actually need to pay for it. The sound is a little bit more extensive than, oh, here we go. The sound is a little bit more, I guess it's better. The sound is definitely better than the last Hisense TV that I've tried. And that might have to do with Dolby part. And I guess that is appreciated, but I would still get a sound bar. All right, play for free with ads. Okay, it's not loading. It's simply not working, guys. All right, I'm just gonna quit out of this. I might need to reboot after doing a, a final update. So let me go back down in here. Let's see if I have, uh, if there's anything in here I need to update. Okay, let me, let me go down here. Let's keep going down. Language. Those are the three languages that this one supports, which is a little bit different than the other TVs, other, the other Hisense TV I had supported other languages, but that could be just the whole Google thing. Google Assistant, all right, that's perfectly fine. Chromecast, Android Shell, yep, that's just letting me know what's going on. Screensaver, location info, yeah, that's fine. Usage and diagnostics, automatically sends diagnostic information to Google like crash reports. I'll turn that off. Set up assistant, if you need it to go and set up your whole TV again, you could do that. Enhance viewing, this is the part that um, I went ahead and, uh, <laughs> that's the part that I disabled for privacy reasons. IP control port, that's not something that I'm using. You'll need to turn this on if you have some other advanced home uh, automation stuff, probably. I don't have that. Uh, favorite TV button setup. Okay, so there is an actual favorite button on here and I can configure what exactly that does when I press it. So I can have it say, for instance, just open up YouTube. Clear cache, you're gonna have to run this periodically. If, you're, if your system seems to be running a little bit slower, you get some weird issues, clear the cache. I'm just gonna clear it now. And uh, let's go ahead and start. 
and I'm going to uninstall that game because that game was not working and I definitely don't want the game in here. Security and restrictions. Okay. I get a lot of questions about this all the time. On Android, can you install other apps on here? Yes, you can. Now, if you use Android and you, you, know, you jailbreak your phone, you'll understand what this is about. And if you don't, leave this alone, okay? So unknown sources. Um, you can allow certain apps in here to go ahead and install unknown apps, all right? Now, turn it off if you don't want to, okay? It's better if you turn it off. So you can turn it off, right? Uh, this way, it, I mean, just read the instructions right over there. So if it's an un unknown app, it wasn't signed, it wasn't checked by Google, etc., cetera, then um, that's called an unknown app, right? So turn that off. You can verify the app. There you go. That may cause harm. So leave that on. Turn off unknown sources. Leave that on. But if you have certain apps that is not available in the Google Store, you want to do it yourself, you want to install some other apps that are not signed, or you're a developer, obviously you turn on unknown and you turn on verify apps. And then this way you can install whatever the heck you want and run it off of the phone, off of the device. Note the limitations though. 4.3 gigabytes of internal and you got to plug in USB port. Accessibility features is pretty awesome. I definitely like what this has. I went over this in my last video and you can check those out. But this is really great for people who have accessibility issues, okay, who are, um, I don't know what, what the proper PC term is, or ha who are uh, handicapped, okay. So it's really nice to have those in there. If you need to reset everything, like you messed up some settings, you don't know what the heck's going on, the reset button's over there. And I think in the about, this is where I do a system update. Okay, so I'm gonna go and click on system update. I'm gonna check for updates. Chances are there's gonna be an update that's gonna make this smooth. In fact, um, okay, so it looks like there was no update. Maybe that's why it didn't ask me to go ahead and install one. Since this is new TV, probably fresh from the factory. And apparently you got some other information on here. The model of this high smart TV A4, version nine, software version, and a bunch of other details in here that could be useful in helping to troubleshoot your TV set. Okay. So that's, that's it. I think I've went over just about everything about the TV, picture quality. I'll see about playing something on, uh, on here without the volume. So we just look at the picture, look at the picture quality. And it, it's using my other YouTube account to look for this stuff. I'd say it seems pretty decent. All right, uh, 4K HDR fireworks. Let's take a look at that. Okay, that doesn't look, that didn't look really good, but I think it's just YouTube. The black levels are enough. It's decent. I'm more than happy with it at the $550 price range for a 70 inch TV. I'm gonna say that right now. This looks, this looks pretty good. Now it doesn't get too bright, so I don't feel like the fireworks are really, you know, just out there. And even though this says it's HDR, this is, uh, I, guess, I guess the dynamic range is good enough. The contrast seems pretty decent. Now, I'll have to watch this in, later on pitch black at night, see if any of the contrast bugs me or lack of contrast, contrast ratio, see if anything like that bugs me. But I'm looking at this and this is really good. This is something that would be unheard of for the price and the size of picture quality. So I think this VA panel is decent enough for what I intend to use it as a secondary TV or monitor, okay. Now that pixelation down there below, I think those are just artifacts from the video. It is not the TV set that's doing that. So you see certain artifacts on there. And that's, that's YouTube. YouTube compresses a lot of stuff. Okay, so let me go back. So that, I guess that was it. BBC Earth, Top Gun 2, eight minute trailers. These are just some film trailers. 
Oh, of course, we got some ads that you gotta watch because it's YouTube. And, well, might as well watch some ads. Now, these ads aren't actually recorded in 4K, so keep that in mind. As these are, I'm looking at this right now in person, and I'm seeing that these are uh, 1080, 720. Yeah, the picture quality is good enough. Sound quality, play a little bit. Sound quality is loud enough. It is not deep enough, it's definitely loud enough. It's exploits. But you know what? It's gonna be good enough for watching everyday TV, talk shows, stuff during the daytime, soap operas, etc. Uh, watching movies. What he has to teach you may very well mean the difference. Watching movies, it sounds a little bit better than I thought it would be. Uh, definitely. The loudness is there, the quality is not there, you're still gonna to wanna to get a sound bar. But that's actually decent. Okay, that's a long enough video. So to sum this up, uh, I do believe that this is a really good TV for the price. At a $550 price point, for a TV set or $600 total for a big giant 70 inch 4K TV delivered to your house is a really good deal right now. Uh, if there are any available in stock, I encourage you to consider checking it out. If you don't need the 70 inch and you want the next size down that is the same display quality, then you wanna get the 60 inch and that's at $400 plus tax would be around like $450 here in California. And I think this is a good general everyday TV. It's not gonna be good if you are uh, setting up a home theater, right? You're setting up a home theater if the size, is, size and the budget matters the most, yes, go for it. But there are much better TVs that you just spend maybe like three, four hundred, five hundred dollars more, basically double the price of this, you'll get a much better set for use in the home theater scenario. But for everyday use and for generally anybody, casual gamers, uh, people that wanna use this for a monitor, this might work out just fine for you as well. Uh, I'm gonna do some tests on that and um, I'll do that in a maybe either, either a follow-up video, I have a link down below, or uh, maybe for members only. I'm not quite sure about that yet. But I'm, I'm gonna give this a good solid seven out of 10, particularly for the price, right? Uh, you're really just getting a nice, decent value for this. Now, one thing I'm gonna recommend that you do though, is buy it with a credit card that has accidental coverage protection. Okay, number one, so you get that coverage for nine days. And number two, get one that extends the warranty by at least another year or two, all right? So I have links down below for that of what I use to go and purchase things. And um, you know, check those out and uh, consider using one of those so that uh, you get extended a warranty coverage on here. Because this is still, no matter what, it's still cheap TV. I just open it up, everything works fine. Uh, you want that extra coverage if you didn't pay for it separately, all right? If you didn't pay for it separately, if you did pay for it separately, then obviously, you know, you're gonna pay like an extra $100 or $200 for two years of coverage or something like that. But is that really worth it on $550 TV? I'm not so sure. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and enjoy the TV and when it gets a little bit darker, I'm gonna go ahead and do a bunch of other tests on here and connect it onto the uh, computer come in. All right, that's it for this video. Please give it a like, subscribe for more, and I'll catch you next one. Thanks for watching.